Les. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Petros from Serious Game Institute, Petros Lameras. Uh, Serious Game Institute is a, a research center associated with the Coventry University. They are very, very well known in the Europe arena in the terms of uh, Serious Game development. They are very active in the medical domain and in many other uh, domains, including a school, um, training for companies. And Petros, whenever you're ready. So, hola. This is the only word that I know uh, from Spanish, so. <laughs> so apologies for that. I hope that uh, you're going to understand my presentation. If I'm too fast, then just please tell me so, and I'm just going to just slow the pace and everything. So if you have any, any problems with the way that I'm talking or anything, just let me know, and I'm trying to do my best to facilitate the whole, the whole talking thing. Right, so I'm not going to bother you with uh, many things about uh, Coventry University and what we do as SGI. I'm just going to be a bit very, very brief about uh, what we do at the SGI, and then I'm just going to present uh, some of my own personal research trajectories and research themes. Uh, and also, I'm going to just present some of our work and some of the games that we have presented along with our research uh, projects, uh, specifically focusing on, uh, on STEM for, um, as, as some sort of an innovative process in terms of uh, developing games, that uh, are aiming to facilitate the design of teaching and learning uh, for STEM uh, in, in specific instances uh, that we're going to, uh, to see in, in, in due course. Um, so Coventry University, this is our building, this is where we are actually um, are placed at the moment. So it is at Coventry in the United Kingdom, so it is about one hour from London by train. Uh, Coventry was built in 2007. It was with uh, funds by the European Commission and uh, it is a center of excellence, this is actually how we call it, for uh, creating games for education, for health and for the environment. Uh, this is a virtual uh, depiction of the building and how are we actually located. So as you can see, this is the entrance. This is the entrance of, of, the, of the building. We are located at the, the third floor. At the second and at the, uh, on the ground floor, we have all our labs. Uh, at the moment, we're actually doing some sort of research with uh, intelligent interfaces, with, um, with Oculus Rift and with some other fancy new uh, technology kits. So these are all uh, at, the, at the ground at the first level. At the second level, we have our research uh, facilities and we're just doing uh, our research on, on games. Uh, so in a nutshell, uh, we do applied research in games. We're saying that we're, it is some sort of an applied kind of a process because uh, it's not only about uh, seeing and researching and evaluating how games are being instantiated and are being used in our own kinds of research, but it is also trying to find some sort of an implementation and usage out of it. So we're trying to see how the games that we are actually creating and the research that we are doing in terms of the efficiency, in terms of the evaluation of how the game can be provide some sort of a uh, different intervention, comparing, comparing it with some sort of a traditional interventions. So we're trying to see it in comparison to, for example, if we want to measure a specific learning outcome. So we are um, comparing some sort of a teaching and learning aspect activity, for example, lecturing or, for example, solving exercises. We're doing the same thing by um, uh, developing a game and by using a game. Uh, so we are actually doing games design, development, and evaluation. We have our PhD students, so they are actually developing our, their PhDs in different domains, um, especially uh, for both evaluating the game itself, but also in terms of designing and developing it. I suppose that it is not some sort of a PhD if you are actually doing everything, 
both the design, the development, and the valuation, and everything. It must be some sort of a kind of a very, very demanding process to, to do everything. So we're trying to just focus on the um, research part of the game. So it is the, the, the evaluation. So part of our team and part of, of, of the lab uh, is trying to help the PhD students by creating the games, by developing it, and then for the PhD student to just do the research out of it. And also we have some commercial services, so there are some businesses, some startups, and some spin-outs of, of Coventry University, so they are coming to us and they are saying, could you please help us, for example, develop this game for this specific instance, this specific market. So we try to develop it, uh, try to design it in a way that it is some sort of a customer-based design. So the customer specifies the needs. It is some sort of an iterative and participatory approach for us. We're working with the customers to find the best optimal way to design a game that they would be happy with that. So it's some sort of a different kind of thing, isn't it? Because when you are doing research, uh, you're, when we are participating in, in projects, they do, you don't care to just propose some sort of a prototype, you know, fully fledged, fully game, that it's going to be some sort of a substantial kind of thing. But for the customer, it's a totally different thing. If you want to develop something, then you have to develop it in some sort of a way that uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make sense for the customer itself. Um, so, as I've said, uh, I would like to just uh, explain a little bit more about what we mean about applied research and how SGI is going to do that. Uh, so we've got these applied research projects, which are predominantly European ones, but also we do have some national ones based on this UK Research Council funding, that it is prestigious for the university. We've got our research seminars. Professor Pam Cato is the, uh, the lead of such seminars, which is also the director of the SGI at the moment. Our PhD, PhD students are just, mm, we do have 10, uh, if, I, uh, if I'm not wrong, at the moment we're doing PhDs in various serious game design areas. And also we have these internships on design and development of SGs. So if someone, for example, has just graduated from the uni, they would like to do some sort of research or some sort of development work on games. So we would be more than happy to facilitate these, this effort and try to work with us in our different uh, projects and do research and help us a bit with, with our work. And of course, at the same time, they're going to uh, see what it is to work in an intensive games, games development department, like being, for example, in a game studio. Uh, so at the moment, apart from the SGI as an entity, we have uh, some SGIs overseas. So for example, there is one in Mexico, in South Africa, in Singapore, and at the United States. We've got over 200 international partners on funded projects. Uh, we try to have some sort of internationalization strategy uh, expanding in, in Brazil. We do have some interns from Brazil at the moment, so we're trying to create some synergies with organizations outside of Europe, so actually to expand a bit our borders and see how this strategy is going to develop further beyond uh, the, uh, the European uh, zone. Uh, and of course we have alumni and fellows in, in different continents in the uh, UK. So these, th this is a non-exhaustive list of the uh, projects that uh, we have actually taken care of at the moment and we have implemented. Uh, we have collaborated with, uh, with Balta in, 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 in Gala, of course, now in, in, uh, in Beaconing which is a fantastic project and also in other different projects as well, which have to do with games for education predominantly, but also there are some other uh, projects that have to do, for example, with, um, with health and, and education and for languages as well. So just in a nutshell, uh, what are our research trajectories? So from the left-hand side, you see uh, projects that have to do with health. On the right-hand side, education. Uh, uh, predominantly, we're interested in seeing how uh, games for STEM uh, are uh, influence the, uh, the design 
of teaching and learning activities, especially for how are we going to correlate, for instance, learning outcomes, learning activities, assessment and feedback methods by using STEM, uh, by using games for STEM. Also, uh, we do have projects that have to do with the environment. We're actually uh, trying to see, for example, try to uh, develop some gamified metrics for measuring um, environmental processes and, uh, for example, how, the, how buildings are measuring their, effect, their efficiency in terms of energy consumption. Uh, so we're trying to just uh, be able to uh, instigate, let's say, gamification processes to different kinds of core areas, right? Uh, so, in terms of the educational research project, I would like to just focus on a couple of uh, current projects that uh, are quite interesting. So the first one, it's called uh, Inspiring Science Education. Uh, we're trying to build some sort of a repository with different science tools and science processes where science educators can actually log in and see, for example, that if someone, if a teacher teaches, teaches physics, for instance, or chemistry, then he or she could find appropriate tools for that. They can uh, mash them up with different technologies that they are using and just um, instantiate them uh, uh, automatically from the repository to the classroom. Uh, another one is the Magellan, which is about creating an authoring environment for location-based game. I have a very nice video to show you, uh, which is about uh, helping people with no technical skills and with no um, logic behind how to program something to create their own games very easily with visual, with visual programming, just like that. You don't have to actually know about how to create something programming-wise, but you can actually just connect different blocks of, um, let's say, of logic, and then you can actually have a, a, a game. Let me just show you this, this nice small video to... Um, Um, right. Is it working? Let me just see. No. Some sort of problem. Problem. It's all right. Come on. Doesn't work very well. Sorry about that. Right. With location sensing technologies, our planet becomes a big playground. The next revolution in computer games is location based, where your location is a part of the game. So we're trying to have these location-based uh, interventions. So you're going to see them.
So this is what we're trying to do. <clears throat> I'm not just going to go back to the presentation, otherwise it's going to be a huge time just to show everything. So yes, what we're trying to do with Magellan, we're trying to actually help all these creative personas and people who don't know how to program something and they want to actually create something that will be unique, very creative, very nice, very location-based. Uh, so we're providing the authoring environment for them to just do that. And also we do have this asset kind of thing when they can upload their game so others can actually download it, they can share it, they can modify it, they can reuse it, they can do whatever they want. Um, so I think that it is quite, quite nice intervention, especially for the ones who want to create some sort of learning activities which is outside of the classroom, for example. So how are you going to merge, let's say, formal and informal learning, right? How are you going to do that? I mean, so if you do have the tools, if you do have the processes and the strategies, then you can do it easily. So for example, let's say that you are a science teacher, right? And you would like to create some sort of a nice location-based scenario which is um, in a museum. So you go to Italy, you see a, you know, the Galileo Museum, so you want to actually explain how Galileo has actually uh, observed the different phases of, of Aphrodite, let's say, for example. So he can actually do this by specifying specific specimens during the museum and see exactly what the students are doing from their mobile phones and create a nice game out of it. So this is what we, uh, what we envision as the next big thing, big thing in, in, in education. How are you going to just make this seamless transition between formal and informal learning? How are you going to instigate these deeper learning processes? So it's not about only mastering content. It's, only about, it's also about how are you going to apply this knowledge into real world settings. So we're just providing these tools in order to do that. Um, so also we're providing all the game assets, all the 2D, 3D environments, for example, um, characters, uh, models, everything that has to do with the actual design and art of the specific models and scenarios that uh, the users are trying to do, we're trying to, to help them and do them. So we're using 2D, 3D as Max, we're using Unity 3D as our basic scripting language in order to do that. Uh, these are a bit of, of a techie thing, so I'm just going to move on very fast. But these are some of, some of our models that we are creating, some of the environments that we are doing, and some of the things that we are developing technical-wise and artistic-wise. Uh, so towards a new learning and teaching paradigm with the use of serious games, this is what we are trying to do, and this is why we are creating such games. So the overarching questions that we would like to ask is, why games can be used for enacting teaching and learning? What is these basic advantages and features that we would like to see in teaching and learning? So obviously, as we know, at the moment it is a bit stagnant when you're teaching. I mean, only by presenting the theory and just try to emulate what other people are doing and just try to pour with knowledge other people's heads, this is obviously something that it doesn't work. So. By games, we're trying to just mitigate this problem and go on to a situation where the presentation of nice environments and graphics and where we can actually promote collaboration, interaction, construction, a kind of a constructive way of perceiving knowledge and, uh, and activities by providing instant feedback by actually evaluating what the teacher is doing in real time and this is something that Balta knows to do very well and this is how we, we, we want to create games, games that can actually evaluate instantly with stealth learning behind it what the teacher and the student is doing so it's not only the, the, the student itself who is actually learning but it's also how the teacher is propagating the whole thing right so we need to see not only the student's performance, but also the teacher's scaffolding effort in order to just do that as well. Uh, so this is how can we understand how learning is enacted. So this is where the teacher's role is, is, is very, very important for us. How games can contribute to learning outcomes, visualization and measurement. How we can visualize what the student is doing so we can understand better 
where we can actually focus so that we can provide the specific support and guidance that they want. How can we train teachers uh, to teach better? What games should we actually have? What pedagogical modalities, what pedagogical approaches do we need to design in a way that it will help teachers to learn them better by using serious games? Because at the moment, science teacher training, especially for scientists, is not the one that we want. It's not about actually presenting something and that's it. And then we assume that the teacher is going to just enact that in the classroom directly. This is not something that we know. It cannot be measured, it cannot be specified. So we need something where we can have actual results. Every, everything that we're doing, we need to measure it appropriately. This is only how we can improve. If we don't have some metrics and data to see what other people are doing when they are learning, either they are students or teachers, then it is impossible for us to understand and to personalize this learning experience. Uh, and this is, the, uh, this is the topic and the trend that is currently going on with serious games. How can we measure deeper learning processes? It's not only about surface learning, it's not about actually learning only the basics. It's, it is applying, it is actually producing a tangible product out of the knowledge that you are gaining. If you don't produce something, then <clears throat> you can't see how this learning has been experienced. Uh, so in order to do that, first of all, you have to create the theoretical basis out of it. You have to create instantiations. You have to create the critical mass of uh, creating all the bits and bobs, all the bits and pieces so you can see exactly how this measurement of learning can be enacted through serious games. So at the AGI, we're trying to uh, do that by creating different frameworks, different models, different approaches that uh, it will facilitate, it will help us actually to see what the learner is doing and what the teacher is actually uh, doing in order to support learning. Uh, again, uh, this is something that we would like to focus on uh, a bit further, especially for teacher training. So we're trying to just emulate and design specific learning activities and pedagogical models that have to do with specifically with science teacher training. Um, also, I'm going to get back to the uh, educational aspect, but I'm just going to do a pause just to uh, describe a bit about the other projects that we're creating as well. So we have another one which is called Pegasus. It's about health. It's about uh, helping teenagers to have a healthier life, to know what they eat and to know how they need to exercise in order to have, as I've said, a healthier intervention life. Uh, so this is again an FP7 large-scale project. We're creating a game which is based on a uh, 15,000 item database. So we're trying to extract different food material and the ingredients of each food and trying to materialize them, try to visualize these ingredients by picking them up on a serious game. So for example, a student can actually pick up a specific card with an ingredient of a... Uh, of, of a fast food like a hamburger or something like that. And he needs to, to associate it with uh, the calories that he might actually want, he's going to take uh, when, when he's eating the burger. So by that way, he's actually learning and he's actually seeing the implications and the consequences in terms of his or her health, health when, when he's eating um, a burger or, or, or drinking a Coke or something like that. Uh, again, environment project, as I've said, we're trying to create interfaces that uh, they can uh, measure uh, building efficiencies and energy efficiency as well. So, for example, if we can have a specific uh, building interface where we can measure uh, the energy efficiency of a specific building and try to see what needs to be <coughs> improved, then that would be something really fantastic. So, again, we're creating all these nice uh, research infrastructure where we can actually see the differences between uh, buildings that they don't have these measurement processes with other buildings that they have it and see the results in practice and how they can actually uh, improve their, uh, their, their energy habits. So as I've said, we're trust, 
trying to create this innovation in a niche research area, which is about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, so we are trying to help uh, academics, universities, industry-led organizations, schools as well in particular, which is actually the main focus at the moment, to access scientific inquiry. And when they are accessing it, how are they going to master it? To master it? How are they going to just use it in their own context? So by this way, we want to help all these organizations, universities, teachers, to pursue excellence, to develop themselves. It's not about actually doing, doing it at once and trying to actually be in a way that they're going to be the masters of knowledge at one hand, but they're going to see the development process, they're going to start using it, they're going to start materializing it, and then they're going to see the results in, 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 in practice so they can see how they, they are going to improve. So we do have some certain objectives about how we're going to do that. Uh, among all these objectives, for example, if you see the, uh, uh, the second bullet from the end, it's about responsible research and innovation. And this is a specific uh, policy of the European Commission. So addressing that and addressing how are we going to just do this responsible research and innovation in scientific findings, it's something of a unique importance when we're designing games and when we're teaching other people to, um, to research uh, games and to play such games. Uh, and of course, uh, the overarching thing for us as well is how are we going to just connect innovation and science education strategies into societal de needs and global developments. Again, we don't have to <clears throat> just focus on specific regional uh, problems and uh, regional uh, challenges, but also we need to just widen it, w wide up a bit and try to see what are the challenges in a more global scale, right? Uh, so the, this is the Inspiring Science Education um, project that I was mentioning before. So out of it, what we're trying to do, we're trying to create analytics uh, just to see what the student is doing and what the teacher is actually performing in order to do that. And we're uh, developing a game which is called Simaula. It is about uh, science teacher training and we're trying to teach, to help uh, science teachers to design their learning activities by using inquiry-based learning. So because uh, there, there are some policy documents from the European Commission which said which says that uh, inquiry-based learning is the standard-based approach for teaching science. So bearing that in mind, we've said that why should we not uh, do some sort of a game where the teachers are going to be trained on how to teach with inquiry-based learning rather than just reading it from the reports. It might be more of an efficient kind of thing rather than just get boring out of reading all these, you know, uh, documents and policy uh, research report, which at the end of the day, they are not something that you're going to for, for remember for the rest of your life. So we have developed this, this game, which I have included some screenshots. It starts by <clears throat> presenting the objective, right? Which is the goal of the game. I mean, how are you going to just see, how are you going to communicate, let's say, to the teacher what he needs to do? So we have created these objectives. For example, it is, starting by asking one inquiry-based question. So when the teacher is just completing this objective, then he moves on to the next objective and so on. So this is the logic out of it. It's some sort of a uh, nested dialogue uh, game. So you will see this is the, uh, the main game mechanic of uh, Simaula, which is about having a question, and then having multiple answers. And then the user needs to actually uh, pick on the, uh, the right one, on the right answer. So if he doesn't pick on the right answer, then he loses his objective. And also, if he does pick the right answer, then uh, there are some uh, student progress bars. So for example, if he's going very well, then the student gets motivated, he gets uh, his, his attention levels are increasing and uh, he's keeping up with the, with the lesson. If he doesn't go well, 
then the students are just getting to have a decreased motivation and decreased attention levels. So we have creating some sort of a uh, algorithmic um, patterns where they are estimating exactly how <coughs> the player is doing. So based on the answers, you know, the, uh, the increasing levels and the decreasing levels of attentions are, uh, are, are being influenced. Uh, so this is the main environment where the three students, so we have developed three scenarios at the moment. So the first one is the electromagnetic spectrum. The second one is the uh, Foucault pendulum. And the third one, it's called uh, the Eratosthenes experiment, which is actually something that is measuring the circumference of the Earth. Uh, we do have, uh, so for example, if you just click on an icon, then, and according to your progress, you can see the, uh, the, 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 uh, the feedback of, the, uh, of each student and, why, and how is he doing. If you're going very well, then you can actually upgrade your uh, equipment into the classroom. So for example, uh, you can upgrade uh, the books with iPads, you can upgrade the blackboard with whiteboards, you can upgrade uh, the whole classroom so it can be some sort of the classroom of the future. So every time that you're going very well, every time that you are improving yourself, then you can actually, with the coins and with the experience that you have, you can buy new things for your classroom. So the experience is becoming more immersive and more interactive for the students themselves. So you can see here, for example, you can see the student data and how each student is, being, is, is getting performed. You can see your achievements and your equipment here. So you're starting with three students and then when you're getting better and better, then the students are becoming five, six, ten, and so on. Uh, also, we try to do some research out of it and see exactly the usability uh, issues of the game. So we've said, for example, what was the overall reaction to the uh, graphical user interface, which was apparently along the lines of the 7.5, which was okay. We've measured uh, uh, the, the, the difficulty of responding to the questions that have been asked. Again, uh, we had a, uh, a substantial amount of people who said that it was, it was understandable. Uh, the, the winning conditions of the game, if they were clearly expressed and clearly clarified, they've said that it was okay. Uh, if the uh, games, the, the, uh, the game's objectives have been satisfied, if they were easy, they, they were easy a bit, but some people found it that they were a bit more challenging. Uh, this is the, uh, the Magellan interface that I was, I was uh, telling you about and I provided the video for. So you can see, for example, on the right hand side, you can see the map of a specific city. I think this is Rome. So then you can specify a specific location here where a location based activity is going to take place. You can have multiple locations along the map and you can do that by easily creating your location-based scenario using the authoring environment here. So as you can see, it's it's very easy thing to do it, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to program anything at all. You just drag and drop different elements from your editor here. You're creating the nodes, and then you're having a fully-fledged game out of it in, in, in matters of, of minutes, for example. And it's collaborative as well. You can have different players doing different things. You can have, for example, uh, the bad guys, you can have the good guys, and then you can collaborate with them to just do stuff all over the city. It's not only outdoors, but you can actually create something indoors as well, as long as you have a mobile with a GPS. Uh, so we have added, now we have, the, uh, we have released the pre-beta version out of it, so we have added some new cool features. So for example, we have this 3D content activity, so you can actually create your own 3D virtual world like you are doing in Unity 3D with all the assets. You can specify conditions where, for example, if the weather is good, then you can initiate an activity outdoors. If the weather is not good, then automatically the activity is initiated outdoors based on real-time weather forecasts. Uh, we have augmented reality activities as well. We have also behavioral elements. For example, if someone wants to do more things and he's more capable technically wise, he can uh, use visual scripting like Lua in Lua language. I'm not sure whether you have heard of it. 
so you can actually do some Lua uh, activities as well, or you can use HTML5, you can use JavaScript as well. So you can program uh, the specific nodes at the behavioral level to see exactly what, 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 what is. And then you can instantiate them. You can create all these different uh, programming uh, level codes, uh, which, is, which is fascinating as well. Uh, now, in terms of, of the projects that we have uh, submitted uh, in, in, uh, recently, uh, the first one is called Catalyst, which is about schools, again, it's about training science teachers, it is about training students, creating all these supportive schools for a cloud-based infrastructure, for creating these large-scale uh, infrastructure, we were going to include some sort of a 3,000 schools for 14 European countries and measure how they're going to learn, how, what are they going to do by creating different tools and, and processes. Uh, so this is the overarching architecture that we would like to use. So you have a cloud-based infrastructure where you're just fetching different resources and different users for specific tools. So you are personalizing the whole process of teaching and learning. You've got different interfaces based on the specific subject matter that, is, that, is, that uh, a teacher is interested at. You've got your analytics, the community services, where uh, specific communities from parents, from teachers, from students, uh, from specific communal members, they are creating them online and then just extract the specific tools of, uh, of the specific community. Uh, we've, we've, we've submitted another interesting project which is about maths, which is about mathematics and the way that you can actually <clears throat> pervade, provide some sort of an immersive and pervasive uh, ecosystem with games, with augmented reality, with construction toolkits, like for example with tangibles, in order to help the students to be able to apply what they know in mathematics with real world examples. <coughs> And, and real-world scenarios. <coughs> uh, we follow uh, the Alan Kay's advice, which in mathematics, the most important thing, as you know, it's not actually how you can learn mathematic principles and mathematic formulas. It's about how you're going to apply them in different disciplines. For example, in computer science, as, you, as you, I'm sure you know, that you need to have a robust and very good mathematical literacy skills. But in order to do that, you need to actually learn how to use mathematics in programming, right? So this is something that we would like to teach the students by applying mathematical ideas and mathematical modeling to actual computer-based infrastructures and computer-based activities. Uh, so what we're trying to do pedagogical-wise, we're trying to just blend uh, inquiry-based learning with the flipped classroom model. I'm sure that you have already uh, know about it. It's, it's the current trend, I suppose, this flipping kind of thing, where some people, they don't understand exactly what do we mean by flipping uh, teaching and flipped learning and all these things, which it has to do with all these videos kind of creating some sort of a uh, video uploads online and then try to have all this time for your students to create all these activities, to ask questions, to reflect and so on. So we thought that it might be a good idea to just do that in comparison to all this technical infrastructure and the ecosystem that we would like to include based on having gamified interfaces and games at the same time because a gamified interface is a totally different thing than a game, right? A gamified a gamification is some sort of a service. It is a process of doing something and a game is the actual product. So when we're talking about gamification, we're talking about, uh, let's say, uh, taking uh, specific features out of a game and then putting it in a non-game context. So we're trying to do both at the same time, which is the innovation of this, of this idea. And then trying to get uh, specific mathematical problems, right, like this one, for example, and then trying to see how this can be emulated by gamifying it, by creating a game out of it. Uh, so this is the model, and this is the conceptual model that uh, we are uh, currently uh, looking at and see how this can be, can be uh, realized. So we have the infrastructure, the ecosystem, 
the different components and the add-ons over there. Then we have a personal learning environment which we are personalizing the whole process. The pedagogical model here with the flipped classroom and the inquiry-based learning. And then it goes back to the classroom where the whole teaching process is taking place. Not the actual content, but the process of teaching, which is a totally different thing. Uh, last but not least, uh, a proposal that we have developed with, uh, with Balta. And I think it's quite interesting and very innovative, which is about uh, how are we going to uh, instigate arts in STEM? How are we going to help the students actually to learn about arts and learn about the importance of artistic minds and creativity and imagination and unleashing this kind of imagination in STEM? So what we were trying to do is that... Uh, we have taken as a scenario the, uh, the F1 car model, which is something that it is being initiated in, in Europe at the moment. So uh, schools that they are participating in this F1 car scenario are uh, letting their, their students to create their own F1 models. It's little F1 car models where they are just designing them by using 3D CAD software. They are printing them out by 3D printers. They are doing the marketing. They are doing the, the commercialization. They are doing everything. And once the, uh, the specific model is ready, because they are learning uh, different mathematical and, and, co and, and concepts about physics, for example, how they can calculate the aerodynamics, how they can calculate the friction, how they can actually create a, a car which is faster than the other car. So when these, yeah. So can I say something? Um, you always mention the science, the science point of view, but no one is mentioning the imagination point of view. Yes. As, as an example, I mean, if you can use the imagination side point of view, yeah. you can create something new. Yeah. Because I mean, we are always talking about you know speed and those stuff, but at, at the same time, I, I believe that uh, uh, as an artist, you right. can have like you know the, the own point of view. Yeah. You can create something new. Of course. Like it's between logic and imagination. Exactly. So, yeah. So this is what we're trying to do with this, with this project. We're trying to mix imagination with more kind of a mechanical way of thinking, like in computer science and engineering. So you have so the student that is participating to that is having the chance to design th something from the scratch, which is the artistic kind of thing, right? Yeah. And then he can calculate all the mathematical and engineering things that he needs to do in order to have a fully operational car. So you're combining the design, you're combining the, uh, um, this substantial, let's say, uh, process which is about doing something and designing something, and then you're putting, uh, outside of it, you're putting all the, uh, all the science stuff. You're going to see in a, in a minute what, what I'm talking about. Uh, so, for example, if you see this, this picture, you're starting by the designing process, you are, so you're having some sort of a design thinking approach. So you're starting by uh, ideating the idea, starting to actually create some sort of an emotional intelligence out of it. So if you design something, if you're actually in the process of creating, then you are getting, you're, 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 you're getting feelings about something. You're getting to love it, for example. So this is a very important thing in science as well. I mean, and in learning in general, if you don't uh, love something, then obviously you can't actually do it to, right. So this is what we're trying to, uh, to do with that. We're trying to create this, this emotional understanding uh, in the students in order to do something that has to do with their own feelings. And then, of course, to just uh, cover it with the science part. So starting with the planning, starting and then uh, going on with the design by not only about the individualistic kind of thing where you're just in front of the computer and you're just using a 3D model, but collaboratively, how are you going to just design something? Uh, what ideas other people have got and how these ideas can be merged together in order to design something that it, it, it will be meaningful to others also. So in order to do that, we have created this 3D virtual world. So it's not about 3D CAD, which is a, a bit stagnant and a bit individualistic. It is about actually creating something that it will be some sort of a Minecraft kind of thing, right? So you're just uh, taking different parts, you're developing them, 
and then you have a fully fledged product, but out of a 3D virtual world, not about actually 3D CAD design tool. Uh, so then you're doing the design, you're going to do the analysis, which is something that has to do with the scientific part. You're making your design by uh, creating this 3D printing out of it and then try to just assemble all the, uh, all the different parts and then test it. Uh, so, as you see, I mean, you're testing different kinds of things, and you can see what you're doing in real time. It's not about just uh, do it, doing it for fun. It's about testing the knowledge and every bit of the, th of, of the knowledge that you, have, that, that you have taken out of this process. So these are the components that we are creating for this project. We have, for example, if you go from the right, you ha we have games that teaches people about what do we mean by design thinking, to create some sort of an awareness for, for the teachers, why it is important to have arts and design within the process of science, why, for example, it is important to create some sort of designing learning activities and try to put them into your curriculum, what tools are there outside that you can actually do that, how you can represent visually your learning designs in a way that it will make some sort of a uh, purpose to, to, to the teacher. Uh, again, how are we going to just analyze what the student is doing? How are we going to evaluate the knowledge that uh, he has granted? Are we going to do it before and after? Are we going to before, during and after? So we're creating kinds of games. We're creating kinds of games in order to just do that. And of course, we have to create some sort of a framework in order to analyze all these things and to see in practice how these are going to be instantiated. So this is an AR component that we're going to develop as well. So for example, when the student is creating his little car, then this AR component is going to just reflect and visualize all the different design components and activities that he has done during this process. So he can explain to his fellow students, he can explain to his teacher what he has done. So he is the master of his knowledge. He's creating the knowledge for himself and for the others. So we're giving all the power to the student. We see the student as a designer of his own knowledge. So the final outcome will be something like that, which is going to be uh, competed. It's going to, to run with, with other cars in different competitions across Europe. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm more than pleased to answer them. Thank you.